welcome back to Reaper Pro Tips. Here we are with me and with Quindy and with a tiny infinitesimal portion of John and Justin. I think they're about this tall. That's how little they are in the stream, but they are here. So we cannot discount them. They are not yet microbes. So <laughs> yes, Bunny got finished. Kodiak, you're welcome. Well, the, since the, it makes it hard, right? Because the rotation is, uh, oh no, Crowley. I'm so sorry. Are you food poisoned? Um, yeah, it makes it hard since it's a six model rotation to, because then the models always move. They're not always bunny on a Tuesday, right? It's, uh, sometimes it's different. Often it's different. Um, so yeah, if I went to a five model rotation, it would be a lot easier because then it would always be bunny on Tuesday or whatever we're working on, you know. But I thought it would be more interesting if people could just randomly encounter the models or not so randomly encounter the models as we painted them. So it was just me. Hey, War Shadow. Um, but yes, yes. Hi, Bob and Julie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bunny is complete with the grassy base. She was even uh, in my handout for the uh, class I did, which those of you on the Patreon will be getting um, as I think a $10 PDF because it's quite long. It's pretty insane, actually, how long it got. <laughs> so, uh, but it's a, it's a $10 PDF on choosing colors for your models. It is kind of completely re-engineered and redesigned. Um, and so I still feel like I need to add a little more to it. But it's already like 14 pages or something insane. Or 12. or so, It's something insane. It's like an insane amount of handout. So that's probably what you're getting for $10 this month. Be happy! Uh... Oh, well, this is New Dude. And then we've got Kitty Paladin. We've got Madame Delia with the big ball gown. We've got the bust. We've got the sorceress in pink and purple. And we've got the centaur. That's our rundown. And we did centaur yesterday um, and did some of his kind of alligatory kind of coloring on his armor. Up, oh, it would help if I was in focus. Focus, that's overrated. Yeah, there's his armor. So we still have to do more on the armor um, to get all the sections of it up to that standard. Although there is a big shadow there, um, but I need to do the front still and stuff like that. So yeah. There we go. All righty. Yeah, four model rotation though. I don't know. I like having a bunch of different models. And if I ever want to drop one out, I can. But I kind of like having a bunch. I like having a bunch because it kind of spreads them out a bit more. Like, we would finish stuff faster if I just did fours. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I almost did, I was doing a five and then I was like, oh no, I want to make it, you know, irregular. So I made it a six rather than dropping it back to four. Yeah, we could always change it in the future. Nothing is set in stone in Anland. Whenever we get a better, uh, yeah, although now there is, I guess there's an argument for, um, it's true we do get more topics covered with six. Like, as far as, like, just purely, like, having more options as far as what to paint. Um. <laughs> Funny, Ify. But, yeah. So, yeah, oh, and I've, of course, I've totally forgotten my palette. Um. <clears throat> so I'm thinking a dark skin tone with this guy, but then I saw how little skin he has, but then I thought, well, maybe a dark skin tone would still be good. Um, that's kind of what I'm thinking because the thing is when you're, I know I'm, I know I want to do him in like orange and purple because we haven't done orange yet. Not really, not like seriously as a main color on a model. Um, I want him to be very, very fancy. So I was thinking orange, but then I was like, actually one of the best skin tones to do with orange is a dark skin tone because uh, it tends to look really good. So, and I also need to look, before we even start, I need to look at all these overlying pieces of cloth and how the heck we're going to do them all. Oh, I did miss a mold line. Crap, I went over this model. I went over this model, guys, trying to avoid the mold lines because it, it, overall this model is a very nice cast. There. Anything else? Any other mold lines hiding that wish to be removed? But overall, this is a superior cast. Um, so yeah, so we'll talk a bit about color composition today. 
Yeah, generally setting green stuff, exactly. So, all right, so I'm thinking dark skin. Um, I'm kind of thinking black hair. It could go black or gray, but I think I want black because it's gonna give us more contrast, but I need to figure that out. So we're gonna, I'm gonna go and get my palette and then we're gonna figure this out. Did experiments with my uh, oil paints last night. I feel um, I'm doing like very, very Anne, very mad scientist Anne experiments with my oil paint to really get them dialed in so that I can start pushing it and seeing uh, what I can do with them. So I'm, I'm excited to look at the outcome of my experiments. This is the thing with oil paint experiments. Because there's a drying time, you actually don't see the results of your experiments right away like with acrylics. You have to just swatch them and then just put them aside and then see like what happens <laughs> oh and I did uh, I don't know if the rest of you did but I I did uh, sign on for the scale scale color um, artist new new Kickstarter I did not go in on everything unlike with the oil set where I definitely did um, I just did the 12 12 key paints I just mostly want the Elizabeth and Crimson equivalent and uh, a few of the other stuff see what they're going to do with it but yeah, so lots of paint experimentation going on. The closer I can get to everything to Master Series, the better. I also got some um, Laszlo. Actually, I saw Laszlo. For those of you who remember Laszlo from ReaperCon's long time ago, he used to teach. Um, but I saw Laz out at the con and uh, judged, uh, judged a Master's competition with him. And uh, he actually turned me on to a matte varnish for oil paints. Uh, and my favorite art company, Winsor & Newton, produces this matte varnish. So I went out and bought a bottle and tried it for the first time last night. And one, wow, that dries fast. And two, it works. So now, now it's on. <laughs> if I can make my oil paint matte, even if it's not completely matte because it's a really oily paint, uh, it's on. Um, more acrylics. No, they don't. They just did the oil Kickstarter Pendrick, so they're not... Um, they're, they're not doing more yet. I mean, they only barely fulfilled that, I think. And they might still be out of stock even on it as far as regularly selling it. Um, but that wasn't that long ago. No, this was a new, a new selection of the tube acrylics, which I do really like. So as we all know, I, it even lives, guys, it even lives on my desk with all my other paints. Like this is the first tube paint that has made it onto my desk with all my other paints. Otherwise, everything here is Master Series, like all of it. Master Series as far as the eye can see. Yeah, Laszlo is an awesome. Also, D. Clearman, if you ever get a chance to meet him at a con, although I think mostly he switched to 2D art, so the only con you're likely to see him at is if you come out here to Kubla. Um, but uh, Laz is just one of those people that I classify as just darn good people, he and his wife Leah. Um, just generally, like, capital G, capital P, like, good, good person generally uh, an exemplary human being, as I like to put it. Um, I took it off. I took it off, missed him. As you can see, it's actually fine. There was a mold line there, but I, uh, I took it off. So we're good. We should be good. I mean, there's a tiny little, like, tiny little bit of, like, suggestion of mold line, but I don't think that's actually going to show up once I get paint on it. Like, I kind of scraped it earlier. I'll scrape it a little more. But otherwise, it's pretty, uh, this was a very, very good casting in general. All right. So, dark skin. Hmm... Cause he thinks, I think he's like, he, he reminds me of like, um, kind of his outfit is kind of Persian almost inside. Oh, I see it. Boop. Let's see if I can get that off. Boop. Come on, come on. Get flaky. 
This is a very hard surface to remove mold lines from because it is um, convex. So it's, uh, it curves inward. It is fairly flat, which makes it feasible to remove mold line this way. Otherwise, the only way that I usually deal with mold lines that are inside of uh, a curved surface instead of on the outside of a curving surface um, is to green stuff. It's the only real fix that I know of, other than a Dremel tool. If you're, um, if you've got a nail grinder that will work moderately well on bones, might work pretty good on these. Actually, it worked okay on Bones Black, and Bones USA is better, like stiffer than Bones Black. So probably my Dremel grinder would work for this. You just have to be real precise with it to get it not to grind away features of the sculpt. But otherwise, I tend to just go with green stuff. Oh, okay. They have a, they have a active, it's still active. I didn't look. I assume maybe today or tomorrow is the last day. But yeah, the 12, um, the 12, the set of 12 was very uh, reasonably priced. So considering how much paint you get in each of those tubes. All right, there we go. All right. Um, skin tone. Ebony flesh. Looking around for all my other flesh colors. Technically, I've got ruddy flesh around here somewhere. I might have to sub in a different color. That's all right, though. Maybe we'll do something like this maybe we'll do something like this for a transition triad so start really dark bring it up with a reddish brown and bring it up with a golden brown oh two hours remaining oh so it's almost i just gave them a bump <laughs> uh yeah so yeah i really uh i like the tube paint if I, if I, if Master Series disappeared from the entire world and I had to choose another paint line to paint with, it would be a uh, scale color artist tube. <clears throat> Though as it is in my normal painting, I still use a majority, I would say a majority of MSP. I still depend heavily on MSP. Just because you can't beat the consistency, adhesion, and uh, amount of colors flow and the finish. Well, Agent Marvel, when you, um, when you say work best, you are usually asking about contrast. Oh no, and my con folders in the other room, my color wheel has escaped. One second, need color wheel to illustrate this point. All right, when you are asking about go better, you are talking about contrast, which means you are talking about color wheel, which means you get out your color wheel and you find the thing. First of all, if you do something like put dragon green up against a color like wilderness green, you will see that dragon green is more cold, more bluish, right? So it's a more bluish green. So then you get out your happy color wheel or your unhappy color wheel, depending on how much you use it. And you say, okay, so green kind of toward here. So then you look at purple and it's over here. So really it's far away, no matter which way you go. But if you go more toward blue violet and you're already here, now suddenly you're getting really close. Whereas if you go further away, you're almost complimentary. So essentially the rule is further away on the color wheel will give you more contrast than close to each other on the color wheel. And the closer you get on the color wheel, the more you will need to introduce color contrast the other way. So essentially you can do any of the above. However, if you go cold with your purple, I would say that you should make it dark and your green lighter or your green dark and your purple lighter. 
usually intuitively the previous one, the purple, dark, and the green lighter makes more sense to us humans, but you may, you may get away with whatever you like. Um, but further apart on the color wheel always quote unquote goes better because it is higher contrast. Yeah, more important even than the color choices, Agent Marvel, is to vary the lights and darks on your figure. So many people just paint everything the same shade. Like everything's in the middle. Like a medium red, a medium blue, a medium purple, a medium green. And they're all like like medium to medium darks. And it all just kind of blurs into itself. So the most important part, even more so sometimes than the color you choose, is to vary your lights and darks on the figure. Don't just reach for your average purple to go with your average green. Think about making that purple really dark or think about making your green a little lighter. And you can do this with highlights and shadows or you can do this with just choosing a lighter or darker color to begin with. So first, first things first, biggest mistake, one of the biggest mistakes made by beginning painters is to just choose a medium red, green, blue, purple, and they all look kind of like the same light or dark wise and they just kind of it doesn't look as good as it could look. Could look. Yes, Miss Dimp has a good point. Take a black and white photo. Make sure you can tell the colors apart. And if you kind of have to look hard to tell the colors apart, then you have to you have to work on your contrast. Contrast is important. I'm trying to actually all my all my models right now have a lot of contrast. So we're we're currently alternating light and dark a lot because that's like one of the things I always do. So. All right. There are three ways you can tackle dark skin tones. You can start with your medium tone and go up and down. You can start really dark and pull everything up and you can start lighter and do shading. Um, if you start lighter, you will end up with a lighter dark skin tone. If you start like really dark, then you're gonna end up with a really dark skin tone. I think I'm going to start really dark this time because we have done really dark once before. We did it on Sphinxy, but Sphinxy is much larger than this model. And so Sphinxy, it was a lot easier to do it. And so I thought this, this model would be a very much a challenge to do it because it, he doesn't have really much face or he has hand area at least, but his face will be a challenge. But I want the contrast, so I think I'm going to do it. Yeah, you can almost go, always go into edit and just make your pictures of black and white with phone, phone photos, phone toes. There. Alrighty. So Ebony Flesh um, and Ruddy Flesh are the two dark skin tones and bones, and they are superior. Very, very superior. Empty Flesh is a really dark brown that actually has a lot of blue in it, which means you can shade it with blue liner and get that blue-black skin tone that's very rare, but that is out there. So if you're aiming for that, pardon me, I take my... Take a big slug of my water. All right. But yeah, so if you're aiming for that really, really, really kind of black with like bluish tone almost, um, skin tone then, ebony flesh is your, ebony flesh and blue liner are your, uh, your friends. Alrighty. And you can bring this skin tone up not going golden. I wouldn't do it on a model like this because there's so little skin area. But if you are doing a bust and you have some room, um, you could highlight this almost with blue white and uh, take it up that way. And that will give you that very, very blue-black skin tone. Um, yeah, Ebony Flesh and Ruddy Flesh are the dark skin tones. The The Ruddy Flesh is kind of a very close color to Rich Leather. Um, I just, I thought I had Ruddy Flesh in here and now I can't find it. It's around here somewhere. But it's kind of, it's close to Rich Leather. Um, if you want a more golden African skin tone, which of which there are many, then you would go more that direction. For example, 
also like and, and the same skin tone holds true for like arabic or or any of that for example zari here which we did when i was doing my old D game she is uh started with um ruddy flesh and then she's shaded with ebony flesh and you get that great golden skin tone that's still a dark skin tone but the the kind that really has golden highlights when the sunlight hits it <clears throat> Alrighty. I would say that the most useful triads to have Kodiak are the tan skin triad and the rosy skin triad from Core, and then the ruddy flesh and ebony flesh from Bones. But tan skin wins the prize overall. If you're looking at a medium to lighter skin tone, then tan skin is the most versatile and easy to mix other skin tones from. But if you are trying to, to paint a dark-skinned humanoid, then do get ruddy flesh and ebony flesh. I usually put a transit color in between them, but you can mix them um, to get something in between. It risks going a little bit green because of the high amount of black and blue in ebony and the high amount of yellow in ruddy. But it can it can work. I mean, it worked on Sphinxy. I don't think I used a transit color transition color on her. All right, this is gonna look really dark. I actually couldn't find it in my box. My box is a lot less organized. My desk is actually very organized. My browns are all corralled. My dark browns are all corralled over on the left-hand side. And then usually it's off-white straight ahead of me and black. And then uh, if I'm using a particular suite of colors, then I, like, whatever I used yesterday, like the wilderness green and dragon green combo that I was showing people, that's going to be, like, immediately to my left. So... On the desk, I never lose anything, but my drawer right next to me is where I keep about a hundred paints. And that's the colors that I use most often, most useful and colors. Or whatever I'm, it, it swaps out. I swap stuff out every once in a while. Sometimes I will swap in a color that isn't in my most useful colors, but that I haven't used on stream. Um, because if I feel it's a worthy color, I want to give it, get it some love. So actually, this is a great example of a brush that has been compromised and probably needs to be cleaned. When you can put a brush in water, a Kalinsky Sable, and squeeze the water out and still see splits, that likely means that you need to clean it because you can see the dark, the discoloration at the, at the base. This is my very short Escoda. And Escoda, not my favorite brand to begin with, but... I haven't used this this much, but you can see it probably has some paint built up down here. So if you have a sable brush and it's doing this, you're probably overloading your brush or abusing it or mixing with it, and you've got paint down here. I have abused this brush a little bit lately, so it's the only way to keep them straight, Mattachine, Mattachine. Like, actually, it's even worse than you'd think, Matt. I, uh, I actually do have like little boxes in this drawer to separate out families of colors. So like all my yellows and greens are together. All my oranges and reds are together. Actually, my, my oranges are kind of mixed in with both reds and red browns. And then all my dark browns are together. All my blues in, uh, are together. And then my teals are in with my grays. So yeah, they're actually corralled. Like there are little boxes separating them out inside of the drawer. To keep them straight. And this is because if I did not super hyper organize my life, I would be a train wreck. <laughs> As anyone could tell you, I have too much stuff in my life. And, uh... I mean... Conditioning, it, cleaning is, is, you can try cleaning it, War Shadow. If it's got stuff in the ferrule, then normal brush soap conditioner isn't going to do it. You got to use, uh, you got to get, go to the heavy guns. The heavy guns. Windsor Newton, Newton, brush cleaner and restorer. 
for dried acrylic and oil. So it actually will help if you use oils too. Actually, let's just go ahead and show you guys how I do this. Let's try it. Let's see. Here, we'll do a little bit of brush cleaning quick. So often I will use an eyedropper to uh, get this stuff. And I'll just use a well in my palette. But here I'm just going to grab one of my little plastic cups and pour it out. Because it's a pretty full bottle. And I think it'd be danger, danger uh, to try to pour that into my palette. So I've got a little bit of it here. And I've got my bad brush, my, my sad, sad brush. I'm going to grab a paper towel or a Kleenex or some sort of surface to clean the brush off on. Um, it's non-toxic, but it does take paint off. It's a paint stripper. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. You can soak them. I don't like to soak them because I feel like it. it's just, I don't want to get the glue, the adhesive, adhesive soft. Um... Yeah, it can take a while for a lot for a really thick dried acrylic. It does let you say you can soak them for a while. I have done a whole put kind of put a puddle on my palette and let it soak for a bit, but in general, I don't leave it in the fluid. If I'm gonna soak it, I actually load it up and just kind of leave it that way in my palette. It will take the paint right off your ferrule, so. All right, so here we go. So it does smell like alcohol, like rubbing alcohol a bit. But we're letting it set for a second, and then I want to see. What I like to do is grab one of my wells and kind of put the brush in it or against a flat if you've got a tile or something. Put the brush in it or, or against it and set it down and press it flat like so and roll back and forth gently. And what I find this does, if I do this, is it'll work that that uh, cleaner up into the ferrule. You can kind of see, actually, it's hard to see. Let me see if I can get a, a big base here for contrast and see. But in person, this is actually, I can see the dried paint in there kind of loosening up. You can see it kind of streak there. Kind of like how that, that pale color is kind of going and, and going up the brush a little bit now. So it's because I'm breaking it up. And I can even right now see particles in my brush of dried paint after just rolling this around. So it's it's not like I'm rolling it like I'm not like taking it and putting my hand like at a right angle. It's like imagine that the brush is your hand and the ferrule is your wrist. And you just want a little bit, just a little bit of pressure and then a roll. And that's going to make it go up into the brush. Because you've got that paint up there in the ferrule and you've got to get it out. So, okay, you can see that. Look at how much dirt is coming out already and I'm hardly doing anything. Here, let me get in focus. See those little grits? Hi, Neural. Thank you for the resub. 31 months. Wow. So, you can see even without me doing anything strenuous to this brush, it is pulling the crap out of the brush. And that's what I love about using this stuff is you can really see it working. So... Now I'll take my Kleenex or my paper towel or whatever. And I'll do the same thing. Look at that. I'll actually press it. And then again, I'm kind of crimping that up a little bit. And what that does is that presses the, the part of the brush that's dirty, presses it down into the paper and gets that stuff out. Then you go back, do it again. So what I usually do, I'll put a couple of drops in one of these wells and just keep going back into the well until I've used it all up. Just needs a, uh... and you'll see as you do it that you're pulling up less and less, like you're getting less out of the brush. But look at that. Look at that dark smudge. That's all the crap that's up in the ferrule and I'm still getting it. And look at the little piece that came out. This is how cool this stuff is. Like it, it's strong. No, no mistake. So I'm going to refill my brush, actually, and put it down here. Because I can see that there's still a lot. If I'm still seeing those strong, dark marks down where the ferrule was, that means there's a lot of paint up there. So that's why my brush was sad. Yeah, it's the Windsor & Newton. I've never actually showed people kind of on stream how to use this, so I'm going to use it, show you how I use it. 
because it's not just soaking. I find this gentle rolling where the where it's rolled against a flat surface where you've got that slight crimp so that you can work that paint up into between the bristles because capillary action is totally working for me right now. Look at how dar how dark that's getting. Really dirty stuff. And I can come back out here and I always try to use a different a new section of paper towel or Kleenex in this case so that I can see the progress. I'm seeing less of this now. So that's a good sign. And I'm also, uh, I'm still seeing a fair amount of dirt though, if you look at that. So I still need to work it. However, if you look, look at my brush now. What's it doing? It's making a point. I've lost the spidering. Yeah, it really depends. Like sometimes I have to do this a couple of times. And then after you use this stuff, this is important if you're using it with a good sable, after you use this stuff, like in, for a bad brush, you might need to use it for like a couple of rounds of this. Um, then definitely condition it because this stuff is, I, I suspect, um, easily going to strip the oils out of, you know, the hair. It's going to dry out your brush a little bit, I think. Just, just looking at it and what it does and the, and the type of chemical uh, it smells like, I'm going to say I would condition after using this. Just like after after using oils and cleaning my oil brushes, I would wash and condition. Yeah, see, look at that. Look at all that stuff that's coming out. Like, it's all getting pulled out of the ferrule. I'm going to actually do yet another round because I'm still getting so much out of the brush. You would be shocked how much crappy paint can get inside the ferrule. So if you've only cleaned it once... Try to clean it again. Now, if you've really abused a brush, you're not gonna get it back. So like if you are working with a, a crappy Teclon that you have totally like, like it's solid down here, um, chances are that when you do this, you're gonna like lose a lot of hairs and the brush is gonna kind of get distorted. Um, so like it's, it's not good. I feel like it's not as good if the brush is too far gone. This is something where if you notice spidering at the beginning, you should catch it then. Oh, it's, there is no like proper way to condition. I just honestly rainbow just, I just wash my brush with a little warm water in and, um, hand soap or dish soap, whatever. Uh, and then I just take some human hair conditioner. David keeps a little travel bottle right next to our sink in the art room. Um, and we just have that little bottle, travel bottle of conditioner and, and I'll either just, usually I just squeeze out a tiny bit and catch it with the brush and then just point it and leave it. I, I mean, you can use the pink soap stuff too, but I actually use the pink soap stuff more for washing and less for conditioning. I actually like to use uh, hair conditioner and so does David. Windsor and Newton brush cleaner and restorer. It was a bad brush that was spidering. It is a Kalinsky sable. So we are we are now in the third round of cleaning. We're still getting a fair amount of goop. Now I'm going to start going faster here, though, because I've been going slow. If you want more information, watch the VOD. Like, if you want to see me do this from the beginning, catch the VOD after the stream. But now, look, there's a lot less. Can you see? There's a lot less stuff coming out in this brush. I just put a clean amount of cleaner, just like dipped my brush in the clean uh, fluid and I'm getting a lot less. So that's a sign that we're doing well. Like look at all these little prints. Okay, so it's getting a little lighter. We're still like, some of what we're seeing on here is like previous, previous cleaner. So we have to like keep doing it and I'm gonna speed it up. See, okay, we're getting lighter now. And that's a sign that we're almost done. But yeah, honestly, for conditioning, I think people overthink it. Like, after I use a solvent, like something solventy like this, I'll, I'm going to assume it's going to kind of strip some of the oils out of my brush, some of the stuff that keeps the hairs nice. Look at that point now, guys. Look at that. That's what we want to see. And I haven't even, like, made an effort to, to point it. I've just been cleaning it, and now it comes to a beautiful point. You guys saw it at the start of this. It was, like, all in tons of points. All I had to do was take the stuff out of that ferrule and it came back. And with these shorter brushes, this is a short brush. Like it's as far as the width of its ferrule versus the length of its bristles, right? This one is my really beat up um, Da Vinci Maestro. So you can see it's one of those wedge shaped brushes. These are especially 
prone to doing this if you misuse them. So if you... Yeah, exactly. So if you... Um, if you find yourself, like, that you have a bad habit like I do, like, sometimes after I take a brush full of water and throw it in my paint, I'll just use that brush to mix with, even if it's a good brush. Um, if you find that you have those habits... Keep aware of it and know that if you use that, if you do that with, with shorter, thicker brushes like this, you're likely to run into problems. You'll probably have to clean them. So now I have a, again, I've got my little tiny bit of this cleaner in here, which has enabled me to keep this clean, which means that I will be able to just pour it right back into the bottle. Whereas here, I've got so little here on the palette, I can just wipe it out with this, with this Kleenex. So, and we'll go over here. Oh, now we're getting really clean. Look at that. So when you get to that, where you're only getting a little ghost of that material, I would say you're pretty clean. Maybe one more. Depends on, on if it's one of your best brushes. If it's, honestly, if it's, one of, if it's an expensive brush that costs you a bit and it's one of your better brushes, I would take the time to fully clean until you can barely see a ghost of color there. So let me just, yeah, there we go. So right out there, when, you, when you're only seeing that much, you're pretty good. I'm still getting notice. I'm still getting a, a, some flex out of the, the ferrule here. Like you can see that little dark speck there. So if that concerns you, you could do another little. Notice also that I'm not doing the press down and roll so much anymore. I'm just kind of doing some, some real loose rolling with it. Yeah, so that's perfect. Right there. That any discoloration is probably purely discoloration from the mix itself and not the brush at this point. All right, so because I don't want this brush to be mad at me, I'm going to use my Kleenex to just wipe out all this stuff. It's going to evaporate out and it's going to be fine. I'm going to put the remainder back into my big bottle. And then I'm going to real quick go and I'm going to use, we've got some master, I think it's master's brush soap and conditioner. So essentially I'm going to get some water. And I'm gonna, I don't actually like rub my brush in the brush soap. I'm actually not into that. I just get some on my fingers and, and clean the brush. And then just get a little bit of like hair conditioner, just human hair conditioner. And uh, just full strength, just smear it into the brush and it'll hold. And then just let it sit and get, uh, get nice and moisturized again. So let me go and do that real quick because I just want to make sure I don't leave this brush drying out. And I'll be right back. segue but I think it was worth it since I had the opportunity to show you guys what a difference it can make but honestly like it's so rare that I clean my brushes like this yeah the Winsor Newton brush cleaner will take primer off because it'll take oil paint off dried oil paint so okay so this is the soap this is um yeah masters masters brush cleaner and preserver this is what David's got by the sink. You can tell that he actually has uh, used it to press his brush into it and he's worn a groove in it. It's obviously well abused at this point, but it's still perfectly fine because it's a cake soap. And then he just keeps a little bit of a, of a conditioner. Just This is just a travel size conditioner. It doesn't matter what brand you use. There it is. You can see a little bit has come out. I'm just going to grab the little bit that came out through the nozzle here so that I can get it just on my brush. And I'm just going to kind of point my brush nicely work the conditioner through it a little bit. Um, and once I've got it at a nice, uh, nice sharp point, I will just set it aside out of the way to set. And I'll usually let that go overnight. Like why bother? Like conditioner is fine. Like I think leaving your brush in olive oil is like extreme. <laughs> like you shouldn't need to like, like, okay, leaving your brush in olive oil, I can't believe it would actually, like, like, yeah, oils will absorb, but 
Like, why? <laughs> like, just why? I mean, yeah. Ha, cursed. Anyway, I'm going to put these guys back. The cleaner and the conditioner. Like, okay, for one thing, if you leave your brush in olive oil, you're going to have to wash it again anyway because the oil's going to want to repel paint. <laughs> Like, okay, if you're using oil paint, then using olive oil, right? Yeah, Stefan's World, everybody on the internet will tell you all sorts of crap. <laughs> you could doubt what I say also with the rest of them, you know. What I say doesn't always work for everybody. But, uh, but yeah, that's just ridiculous. I mean, come on. Use your critical thinking mind. Critical thinking mind says, oh... I mean, always ask the why. When somebody makes an outlandish statement like that, ask the why. And then stop and think about it. Oil is hydrophobic and we're working with water-based paints. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm laughing. I'm lolling very much at that one. Yeah, just like conditioner for your hair. Exactly, Pixie. Because you're, because this is hair. Like the sables, the sable brushes have hair. So, so uh, yeah, just a little conditioner. Just because some of the 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 cleansers and abrasives that we use can, can or cleansers and um, and stuff we use are can be abrasive to the hairs. So, I am crows. You're so far ahead. You should know by now. Uh, Maze, I, if I'm going to dry brush, I use a huge brush. Like, I don't dry brush anything, really, except terrain. And so I will use a very, very large, like, very, very large. Like, this is a size 8, Royal and Leg Nickel. Um, so, for, I don't, but I, I don't really dry brush except for terrain or, or big dragons. So, uh, no, it, it does, there's no point. Conditioner won't work for synthetic brushes because synthetic brushes are plastic bristles. Conditioner is made to moisturize hair. Plastic can't get moisturized. It's, it's, yeah. Not gonna. You can't really do anything once a, once a synthetic brush starts to go except to use the hot water treatment that I think Inara mentioned. Like, you could try very, very, very hot water to see if it might re reseal, like, some fuzzy tips or whatever. But I haven't ever done that. I don't know if it actually works. Um, hold on, hold on, hold on. But yeah, Crow is like, we're not even. Like, you know, we're not even there. <laughs> You should know by now that I fly by the seat of my pants on these streams a lot. Like, and I do this even when I'm painting my own stuff. Like, I have a general idea of, like, where I might want to do a thing. But I don't plan the what until I get to that thing. Like, like the exactitudes and details, I leave it. Because you know what? For me, and not, not necessarily, like for anybody else crows, but for me, deciding everything in advance that I want to do like really precisely kills my enthusiasm. I like to actually have a little bit left to discover. This probably comes like from me. Um, hold on mage bits. I'll get back to your brush question in a second. This probably comes from me like being a pantser as far as a writer most of my life. Although I'm much more of a planner now. So I do like do general kind of idea, but I don't do otherwise. Um, otherwise, Mage Bits, my two favorite brushes. I don't have a three favorite brushes because there's really just two that I love. And those brushes would be... Brands would be... The Da Vinci Maestro series... And this is a Kalinsky Sable. That's why it says Kalinsky. Series 10, size 1. 
which is I, I use a long, I like long skinny brushes. So that's that one. And then the other brand that I love is Raphael. And remember also, Mage Bits, or Maze Bits, that it's not just a question of size and brand. It's also series. The series of the brush is the shape of the brush. So for Da Vinci, the series 10 is their general round. So you need to not just say Da Vinci Maestro size 1. You also need to know what series you're asking for. And that becomes important here on the Raphael because it's also a size 1. But the series is 8408 instead of 8404. And those 8404 and 8408 are both both rounds. They're just different. The 8408 has a longer, more tapered round. And the 8404 is more fat, more full-bodied. So that's what... Those are the things you want to keep in mind. I also have a Raphael Zero, and just this tells you like sizes are totally different between brands because both these brushes are size ones. Yeah. I don't consider it. I mean, the scroll is cool, but from this, from the viewing angle, you're hardly going to see it. Like as far as doing freehand on it, I don't think the feel the freehand is important. You could make it so. But yeah, I mean, his, his, uh, attitude, uh, the motion of it is definitely a main part of the mini. You're right about that. But I don't, yeah, I don't just don't think about it at this point. No, I'm just a, uh, I'm just somebody who constantly like asks questions about stuff, Maze Bits. This stream is me essentially analyzing everything so I can explain it better to an audience. And I've analyzed brushes a lot to figure out why they work for me, why certain brands work for me. Another thing you should remember is that even though I like these brushes, if you like to work with thicker paint on say a wet palette, then you're not gonna probably like these brushes as much. You might want to go for a thicker brush or a bigger brush. Um, so this this 84, um, this Raphael might be a good size for you, but you may want to go with the fatter version of it, the, the more full-bodied version. So here's an example of the more full-bodied version. So you can see the shape. But yeah, I deconstruct everything, uh, Mage Bits, Maze Bits, because I want to be able to explain it. So. So, all right, so this is another Raphael. This is a big one. This is my size three. This is my biggest brush that I own. I love it. Um, but you can see, don't look at the size, just look at the shape. Look at how the one on the left takes forever to taper down, whereas the one on the right uh, tapers very quickly. So one way you can compare these is to do this. So if you cover up most of the brush so that it's only showing you like that, then you can really see the difference between the full bodied, which is the one on the right, that's the 8404, and the um, pointed tip round, which is the one on the left, which is the 8408. Yeah, for the Reaper, I like the 0 slash 5 size. But I think I've been painting for like a long time. <laughs> I've been painting seriously for about 30 years now, uh, Mage Bits, so I, I have analyzed and tried a lot of different brushes. So there's um, other ones. People like the Rosemary and Company brushes out of uh, the UK. Um, there's, gosh, there's so many. There's so many good brushes. Windsor & Newton Series 7 is kind of a classic sable brush. Uh, if you are starting out, you could go synthetic instead. We were working with this synthetic on one of our uh, one of our bits. This is uh, this is actually from Hobby Lobby. It's a master's touch. It's also a long narrow brush. It's a synthetic, but you can see it keeps a pretty good point. Um, synthetics are plastic bristles. They're not sable hair, and not any natural hair. Although there are some hybrid blends that are a mixture of regular hair and plastic. But in general, the plastic will not last nearly as long. Like it will last maybe a month, 
of intensive painting, maybe, if it's a good one. Uh, whereas a sable brush will last you years with good care. So I was not Seven's World. I was more with a pencil. I was actually much more into drawing than painting for the first two decades of my life. And first three decades, really. The tip, Maze Bits. You want a really good tip for miniature painting. You want a super sharp point. That's what makes a really good miniature painting brush. Everything else is about how much paint you want the brush to hold, what your paint consistency is, what kind of palette you use, all of that stuff. Yeah, some synthetics are really bad and won't even survive a single session without, um, without a, a... So that's why natural hair brushes tend to be the king of the brushes, Maze Bits, because natural hair will hold a point for years if you take good care of them. Like, and by good, I mean razor sharp. Like, I can do eyeballs with this brush kind of tip. Um, this brush has been being abused for, like, two solid years, and I paint a lot. So this is my really abused one. It's thinned down a lot, but look at that tip. It's, like, razor, razor sharp. So... The tip is the most important part of the brush. Everything else, the size, the width, the length, all of that has more to do with how you use the brush and your consistency of paint that you prefer and your palette you prefer than with anything else. And I could break that all down for you, but that's probably something I do on my Patreon, which I think I, I might have. Maybe I haven't lately. I did a thing on brushes, but I don't think I've done uh, an actual PDF on uh, wet palette versus, uh, well palette versus like thin brush versus fat brush versus all that, the correlation. So maybe I'll do that for my Patreon. <laughs> Pro tips, cursed. <laughs> but yeah. But yeah, actually I hold a brush like a pencil for a reason, Stefan's World. Because that pencil is what I'm, I started with. I've been drawing since I was about three or four. And painting did not come uh, easily to me. I had to work a lot. I was a very, very bad painter generally in high school and, um, and college. Like, I uh, was really lost in it. I only started to understand paint more when I really started to get into improving my miniature painting. So don't think that I was really born with this ability. I had to fight for this. Like there was a lot of work that came into getting comfortable with brush, with paintbrushes and with paint. Um, I was terrible at acrylics all through high school and into college. I hated them. Um, so yeah, Mage Blitz, only ever load your brush a little bit. That is exactly, if you caught the start of this stream maze, maze bits, maze blitz, I, um, I cleaned, I used Winsor Newton brush cleaner to actually clean this brush. It was splitting and then conditioned it. So if you missed the part of that, that part of this, uh, stream, then yeah, I covered that. <laughs> yeah, Nora. I think we've all ruined a brush because of super glue. But yeah, I only ever dip about a third of my... You can see where the paint ends on my brush here. I'm going to actually put paint on this model if it kills me. Since we've been talking all stream and we haven't actually put paint on anything. Um... No, I don't. I haven't done it because I feel like it's very, uh, it's something I would likely do for the YouTube instead, Shadow Raven, because it's, for many people, it would be obvious and not very valuable because they already do it. Um, I feel like it's something that a beginner would benefit from, like a rank, rank beginner. So I would probably put it on the YouTube. I'm trying to, trying to kind of like separate out some of my content to be that way. Anything that's really universal, like I feel like everybody should be able to have access to this knowledge, I'd probably put up for free on the YouTube. But the more esoteric stuff, the stuff like I've spent time analyzing and uh, 
the stuff you might not find any mini painter talking about, that stuff you're going to find on my Patreon. I mean, I think a lot of people will talk about brush cleaning. They're all pretty on. Some people overthink it. And some people, honestly, are just trying to be special. Like sometimes when you come across a tip that nobody else has given you, but it sounds kind of weird. I have, I have seen painters like who are just like trying to get like more attention for their channel, just kind of come up with something kind of outlandish like the olive oil thing. And had it work for them, and so then they're all over it, even though maybe it's not the best thing. That's why I would say just try things. And if something sounds wonky, it might be wonky, so question it. So very, very dark on the base coat on the skin tone. Very, very dark. The challenge will be, I think I can get away with it. So one of the reasons we can get away with... Um, with dark hair and dark skin on this model, when usually that makes it very hard to attract the eye, is that I'm planning on going orange on the model so I can put some bright color up on the hat and around him and on the gemstone. Also this scroll, as pointed out earlier um, by Crows, is a focal point and it's gonna be light. So this already pulls the, the eye upward. So I'm hoping to get enough contrast to be able to still draw the eye even with uh, making everything dark right here in the face. I do, but I want to redo it. War Shadow, leather textures. I did a, I did kind of a thing with leather textures that are really exaggerated, but I haven't talked about them lately and I feel like I've refined it. Plus leather textures vary. It's not just one texture. Like you've got the suede texture that's just kind of stipply. And then you've got like, if you're going to do exaggerated creases and stuff, um, there's all sorts of different like kind of looks that leather has. All right, hands. So yeah, there's leather stuff, but I haven't done it in a while. I feel like it's something I need to revisit. Um, honestly, I just use these cheap blocks, maze blitz. I don't like, I have a bunch of fancy miniature holders, but when it comes down to it, I have smaller hands. And so being able to like, just use a small block or a small cylinder is, um, is best for me. So for all of these models, I'm just using these cheapo wooden blocks. Also, I tend to have a lot of models going at once. So the sizing, but these are very inexpensive for us to find here in America. Um, they're very like a bag of them is like $2 or $3. So, and you can also like repurpose them by doing a little bit of sanding and, and then staining and uh, sealing. You can make them into nice bases for your models in general display bases. So, they're multi-purpose and I really like them that they're inexpensive. I just use some blue tack and uh, then I stick the mini on. Yeah, crows, that's about right. I mean, I get really good points on my brushes without licking my brushes. So it's just figuring out how to do it. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of miniatures holders. I have the Games Workshop one, but I tend not to use it. I've, I've lost it, to be honest. David has his. He uses his regularly. But that's like a super expensive miniatures holder, and I only like have one of them, whereas I've got, you know, a dozen or two dozen of these wooden blocks, and they're much less expensive, and I can reuse them just fine. So... I mean, the thing is with a lot of leather textures, they really aren't effective at uh, 28 millimeter war shadow. I mean, if you want to see leather, um, I mean, I did leather belts. That's the most like frequently seen leather you're going to see as far as textured leather on a miniature, but we did it on Knoll, on Knolly, the Knoll pirate. You remember? where we made the edges and we did it on the ogre too, where we made the edges of that leather look cracked. 
I don't know if you saw those. Yeah, Inara has a good point about holders. Just use what's comfortable for your hand. These blocks are comfortable for my hand. Um, I like that I can lay the mini down and have it just suspended above the table surface if it's a plastic mini. Um, and since it's a block, it's not going to move that way. So I can just sit it down. Um, but, uh, I mean, sure, they're a round shape would be a little bit more comfortable on my hand maybe. But I also, this is pretty stable. This is pretty stable grip. But you should use what's comfortable. Oh, everybody's done that at least once return him. Ah, hold on. So like Ogre has his belt here that we did cracked leather on. Ah, Ogre goes sit with Genji. Ogre's in the, in the way. And then Noel, Noel is a much smaller, but notice how this changes, by the way, War Shadow. So notice all the detail I could get onto that big, broad Ogre belt. And then notice the lack of detail that I have to put on a very small surface. I'm still doing the texture, but I, I have a very, I'm very limited in what I can do. So when the the when you can get the knoll here was a study in what text what you can do with textures for 28 millimeter doing any more than this on 28 is is challenging to not in scale depending but on bigger 28s like ogres and giants you can get into it right and then it really textures really come into their own on busts where you can do more realistic cloth textures and leather textures. Yes, actually, there is. If you want, actually, there there you go, War Shadow. So if Quindy can find this, I don't know. But a long time ago, like when I was back at Reaper still and hadn't moved to Cali, um, a long time ago we did a Fire Giant shoulder pad that may even have been back when it was Reaper Toolbox before it was Pro Tips. And that was probably the best example of leather that I've done in a long time. Yeah, the knoll has a lot about textures. Yeah, and uh, Miss Timp has a good point. If you don't want to ever risk dipping your paintbrush in your drink and vice versa or drinking your paint water, um, the key is to use a container that is very different. For my water, I'm always using my Yeti. For my paint water, I am always using my Princess Unikitty Lego Movie Cup or a tiny baby food jar. Neither of those are cups that I'm likely to mistake for my drink cup which is that, or a coffee mug, or a tea mug, in my case. So I uh, highly recommend using very different containers for what you're drinking and what you're rinsing. Okay, Quindy found it. So War Shadow, um, bookmark that one that Quindy just linked. That's a good leather video. And it's on a big fire giant shoulder, so you can see. But it, it really is like if you're painting a normal 28 millimeter adventurer, there is a very there's a limit as to how much you can you can do with uh, with textures. You can do more than you'd think, like and you can watch the entire Knoll video to see how much we do. Because I do fur texture, metal metal chips and scratches, uh, cloth texture, and leather texture on the knoll. Like, we did everything. Yeah, we all do it once and then we learn Agent Marvel. 
After that, it's just about being intentional and not going on autopilot. Be intentional about where you put your drinking cup as opposed to where you, like my, my water dipping cup is always right here. It's always above and slightly to the right. Whereas I keep my drinking thing over here on my left or on my far right. So depending on if I'm at a con. All right, I need to get the underside of that hand, which is kind of hidden and hard to hit. As long as we kind of get it dark, we're fine. We're not gonna go in there and do anything more than a base coat probably. There, all right. Now that hand is base coated. Very, very dark skin. I'm gonna get black. Yeah, having a lid on your thing is also good. I often have a, at a cons, I have a lid on my Yeti all the time. Nope, it is not. Licking the brush is not necessary nor beneficial. I used to be a brush licker. Then I had a friend get sick and uh, they couldn't prove that it wasn't that. So essentially now I've got a wet brush. I've just learned to kind of pull it through my fingers and it's perfect. So all I do, you can see the water there between my, right there. So I've just gotten into, I used to actually point it, but I don't know how I got in this, like pulling it through my hand kind of thing, but it works great. And that's what I do now. I just taught myself to do it. It was nothing anybody ever showed me. So whatever you can do, whether it's just like pointing it like that to get the water off. And now that's part of my painting style. Like leaving that little bit of moisture in the brush is actually a key part of what I do uh, as far as getting the results I do. All right, let's get the black out. I wanna see, I wanna get some black on here so that the skin looks a little bit lighter. You can brush lick if you want, but be aware it is, um, it may not be good for your health. And I tend to be very motivated by being good for my health because I've gone through a lot of uh, health issues. So anything that helps me stay out of the hospital is a plus in my book. So I tend to be very conscientious about following um, health-based uh, directives. But what, what works for you works for you. Just be aware when you do it. The radium girls, yeah. All right, where's my mixing brush? I need to actually be good and uh, use my mixing, my crappy mixing brush over here on this paint. Every once in a while I choose a brush that I just really dislike that's bigger and it just becomes the mixing brush or the sheep. Yeah, we ingest enough crap as it is. Gray Wolf on the nose right there. No war shadow. We don't encourage that on the stream. War shadow is joking. If war shadow is not joking, then it's war shadow's uh, call whether to uh, actually ingest paint. Non-toxic is not food grade. They are not the same thing, folks. I personally don't like to even joke about it because somebody is going to take me seriously and I would feel bad if something bad happened. But then I am very con I try to be more conscious of the link between my like, you know, my words and my actions. So getting those eyebrows, he has very super bushy eyebrows. This is all going to look like it's blending together, especially against this light gray. So I can put the black base behind it to make them come out a little bit more. Non-toxic does not mean food grade. Yes. Yes. Non-toxic not equals food grade. There's no lawsuit that you could win because non-toxic is not food grade. It assumes that you are not a dummy about how you utilize it. If you are using a thing for not its intended purpose and it harms you, no court is gonna uphold you.
Yes, exactly. Exactly, War Shadow. The opinions of chat are solely based on the opinions of the users in chat. Yep, yep. Yeah, just be careful, guys, because, like, even when you're, you may not think you're anybody, but even when you're at a con, if you joke about stuff like that and kids hear you, they could take you very seriously. Just be careful about your words. Uh, Maze Blitz, you are asking things I do not know about. I do not, uh, I don't do sponsorships. Reaper employs me as an actual employee, so I get, um, materials from them, and I get paid by them, but that's because I'm an employee. So you will have to ask somebody who actually takes sponsorship money or sponsorship materials. I will say that it is very not common in the miniatures industry to get paid directly in dollars. You are more likely to get paid in product in general, just because most companies are not very large and don't have a lot of extra cash for promotion. So this show is a Reaper miniature show on the Reaper miniatures Twitch channel, and it is my job so it's what I get paid to do, just like if I was still making paint at Reaper, I would get paid. But I am a uh, exception. My story is not at all what the vast majority of people on Twitch are, you know, their reality. My story is very different from them. So you will want to ask someone else. But I have worked for Reaper for almost 20 years. So, been a Reaper employee. Next year, April, is my 20th Reaper work anniversary, guys. Yes, I've created the Master Series paint line. All these colors, all these colors, Maze made, made Blitz, I created every one, I named every one, and I mixed the formulas by hand for every batch, almost every batch, for 15 years. Then I met a guy and moved to California. <laughs> so now I'm just part-time and I stream for Reaper. I also was a Reaper staff painter for many years. But creating the paint line was part of my job. And eventually the paint became popular enough that I stopped being a staff painter and I just made the paint. So I'm being careful on this base coat, guys. You'll have noticed this. And that's because black is hard to paint over without putting white over it first. So I just don't want to... Especially because I know I'm going to be using, like, bright colors on this. Like, fairly saturated colors, like orange and purple. I don't want to give myself extra touch-ups, so. Yes, paint is made in Texas at Reaper's HQ. Reaper is the only miniatures company that makes its own paint in-house. Other miniatures companies pay a paint company to create their paint. But Reaper didn't know that when it started, and so they just started making their own paint at their company and then they found out that everybody else just outsourced it but by that point they had spent a lot of money on getting the equipment to produce it themselves so they just kept doing that um no actually Vallejo is in Spain a lot of a lot of very good paint companies in Spain and UK I would say most paint not made in China in our industry.
Yes, Reaper probably did not realize how um, perfectionistic and anal I was when they hired me. <laughs> But hey, it worked out for both of us, so there we go. So yeah, I'm being careful, more careful than I would normally be because with black, it's such a pain to go over. If you want to, Maze, I mean, it, I love having new patrons, and I have a lot of material. So right now, if you sign up, you get access to everything I've ever done. It's like three over three years. It's almost actually it's like three and a half years worth of tutorials now. So you can just go and you know it's a really good buy right now because there's so much of it. Lots of material on the Patreon. You're totally welcome. Reaper has a good Discord too, though, Maze. So Reaper's Discord is um, is open to everybody and free, and there's lots of good advice and uh, people on there. So where's our where's our Reaper? Yeah, there we go. Quindy with the Discord link. So you could also join the Reaper Discord, and uh, there's a lot of fun stuff that goes on on there, like the Reaper Challenge League, which is just a good motivator to paint things regularly. Yeah, Reaper's a good company. There we go. So very, very carefully. So now we can see the skin, right? Even though the skin is really dark, and this is why I wanted to fill in the black hair is because now I can see the skin a little bit better. So because everything on this model was so light, when I went in to highlight the skin, I knew it was going to be very difficult to see the highlight color, like if I was light enough. Whereas putting the black around kind of helps frame and make the skin not the darkest thing on the mini. And so I give, it gives me that contrast where I can see the skin a little more realistically as far as what, it, what the highlights and shadows will actually look like. And yeah, I did not prime this model. I don't prime, uh, I do not prime any bones. I just wash them. I find the paint sticks just fine. And then with uh, metal and resin um, and styrene plastic, I do prime just like, cause you have to. It's just what you have to do. But everything I, almost everything I paint on this show is uh, bones, but we are doing a metal model, like Kitty here. You can see the white primer. And Kitty is our model for tomorrow, actually. Bones USA is pretty much, I don't, I just wash them across the board. But Bones USA is uh, really, you should try it, Return It, because... The Bones USA brand, this stuff is a really highly detailed. It's got better detail than some of the other Bones brands. Yeah, I wash all the Bones. Cool, Matt. I'm glad. Yeah, especially the Bones USA stuff. I find Reaper, Reaper's always been a metal casting house, but now that we've got the Bones USA stuff and we're using Sciocast, it's like really, the detail's just as good as metal, like, and it's lighter weight and cheaper. So I, I highly endorse the Bones USA line. Even my, I mean, David, my fiance is totally a paint snob, like totally a mini snob. And even he, he's currently putting like, he's never, he's like, I've never put a high quality paint job on a Bones before. But he is doing it on a Bones USA model that he started for just as a class example. Um, and it surprised him how good it was. So definitely uh, fully endorse the Bones USA. It is, uh, it is the future. Some of the best plastic detail outside of styrene and it doesn't have some of the limitations of styrene. Maybe it's just the way that people sculpt styrene. I guess the styrene stuff from uh, like Kingdom Death is actually very high quality. It's not, GW just likes that chunkier style. I always like affiliate, like in my head, I always associate that style of, of styrene with the actual material. But I guess the truth is that your styrene can be um, higher level than that. Alrighty. Nice return up. Yes, sit down, paint. Yeah, that's the nice thing, Beguiler. 
Um, honestly, the packaging, but D Chevalier, uh, usually with the regular bones, it's going to be white. Sometimes it'll be kind of a paler gray or even a bone color. Um, bones black is gray, like as gray as this. And that is very gray, kind of a medium gray. And Bones USA is going to be just the sharp. It's got the sharpest detail. And yeah, there we go. Bones USA is also more matte than Bones Black. So this guy is pretty, pretty matte. Yeah. So just what they were saying, just by looking at them, if you see a pale gray or a, like, it'd be very light or a bone color or a white, then it's a traditional bones. Bones Black and Bones USA are both good. USA just, because it's a completely different material, it just has a slight edge over black. Um, black being PVC, but uh, Siocast being a whole new beast. Uh, nope, the gray is just the original white with colorant added, by my understanding. But return up, we it may be slightly different because I'll tell you, we've been trying to tune the recipe over the years like Ed has, but I don't, uh, the official iterations, there are three. As far as I know, we just added a little bit of color to the original white, and it's not actually a different formulation. It just has coloring in it because the details showed out showed up a little better. Yeah, give it a try, De Chevalier. Like this guy's really cool, and uh, Lizette is probably my other favorite. So Lizette here is a is a this is a model that David is currently paint. Uh, he used it for a class model, so. He's painting a blue version of this, but she's a great Bones USA, and she really shows you how the tiny detail is there, and it gets really shows up really well. Uh, so yeah. So I would highly, if you try a Bones USA, I'd say this one or like the Wizard here is also very good. There's a lot. Like just look at, get online and look around at them. There's some really nice ones. Bunny is a Bones USA, but she's she's um sculpted with a little less. She's more simple. She's a Bones USA. Um, that is the challenge right now. Uh, Crows, we cannot currently do big models in Bones USA. They just don't have the machine big enough. Like, we could do a 54 millimeter, but we can't do big, big. Yes, they are. They are tinkering with the Siocast formulation. Yeah, there's a size limitation on the machinery, so they're working on it. Like, as Siocast, like, gets into our community, like, our companies around here, like, Reaper's currently, I think, the biggest user of them. Um, but other companies, many other companies in the industry are now very much looking at them. Many, many. Uh, like, I found this out at Adepticon just by, just by talking to people. So, Siocast is the, and Siocast actually had a booth at Adepticon. So they're getting the word out there. Yeah, because metal has gotten really expensive. Tin, in particular. Tin is the base component of metal miniatures. Makes up the vast majority of the model, and tin is, like, skyrocketed in price. So it's just not feasible to do big stuff in metal, and it's starting to get more and more expensive for little stuff. So when you want to get more people into the hobby and make it accessible to them, you want to go less expensive when you can, especially because, you know, it builds up. Like, nice brushes and paint and minis are expensive. They're better than black. Yeah, that's the problem. Like, okay, so this is a plus and a minus. As you get better detail, you also get more brittle. And you're more prone to breaking. So this is this is a thing. This is definitely a thing. Like, the harder you get, the more brittle you get. You notice this in resin as well. So there's always a trade-off, guys. It's just like with paint. It's just like with paint. Where the brighter you get, the more transparent you get, usually. There's, like, physical limitations that are a thing. For sure. So I'm not going to start um, doing anything, obviously, as far as highlights go. We, we got into a lot of different stuff this stream, which is uh, definitely worthwhile. We covered some stuff this stream that we've never covered before. Like I showed you guys actually how I clean a brush that's really, really compromised. And we talked about conditioning and we talked about brushes. And we talked about all sorts of crap on this stream. So 
Yeah, we talked about non-toxic versus toxic. We talked about, you know, bones material. So we spent a lot of this stream not actually getting painting done, which is fine because there's been a lot of streams recently where we've gotten a ton of painting done. And, you know, it's nice every once in a while to have a painting related stream that's more like a QA. and a I feel like this stream was definitely more like a QA, and a a brush, almost a brushes Q&A, actually, since we talked about brush pointing, brush licking, uh, brands of brushes, sizes of brushes, series of brushes, and brush cleaning. So really, this was the brush episode with a little bit of base coating. <laughs> so yeah, so a lot about brushes. Much ado about brushes, plus some base coats. Hey, I like talking about the that stuff, Quindy. I wouldn't have stopped and broken down and cleaned that brush on stream if I didn't think it was really, really valuable. And a tiny bit of color wheel. Yeah, you're right, Agent Marvel. So yeah, this was definitely like more of a more of a um, an FAQ or a, or an AMA, but that's cool. And I like seeing some of you new people on the stream. I hope you come back. Yeah. So and and well, and it also depends how thick it is, right? How thick the piece is. That some of the, sometimes the thinner pieces are much softer. So yeah. I don't know if you can get all the knowledge out of there. Like there's bound to be stuff still stuck in nooks and crannies that I haven't actually done on stream. Like that's that's the great question mark, right? Will Anne share stuff today that she's never shared before? Like using Winsor Newton brush cleaner and restorer and how she does it. <laughs> so yes, one of these days guys, one of these days. That's why, see, that's why doing a painting book, like much as I want to do a painting book and probably will someday because it's on my bucket list, like doing a painting book is just like, well, but then it's all set in stone. And what about the fact that I'm always learning and iterating and there's little bits of stuff stuck in the crannies of my brain that I didn't think to put in the painting book. Like I'd have to be doing, I'd have to do a painting book and then have to do an appendix every couple of years, like do an expansion kit. That's what I'd have to do. The Anne, the Anne painting guide, like, like the, the core. And then I'd be doing like appendix one, appendix two, appendix three of all the new stuff that I work on every, every few years. That's not a bad, it's not a bad idea, actually. All things considered. So yes, Josh is back with Cracky Creative at 2 p.m. USA Central Time. I don't know about additions. I always disliked new additions. I'm because once I own the core, I don't want to have to rebuy the core every year. I'd rather buy like a more information book. Like, hey, I forgot to put this in the first book. So I think that's better. So all right, guys, we're gonna leave you. And I hope you enjoyed this unusual stream. And yeah, we're almost to Friday. Tomorrow we'll be working on Kitty Paladin. We'll be doing more enum 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 enums. All right. Have a good one, everybody. See you later. Bye-bye.